what I was saying is that uh, uh, the vast majority of money in existence uh, in uh, our current systems and the money that we use the most, and certainly the money that we use for the most important transactions and the biggest transaction, uh, is bank money, private bank money. What do I mean by that? Uh, it's uh, our deposits at the bank, right? That we access through our digital cards, through these little plastic cards that we put up everywhere or we just touch things with now. Um, so what, is something different? No. So I could say that I have, uh, let's say, I have a deposit account uh, for uh, one trillion kroner at the bank. But in fact, I could also say that I have a credit for one trillion kroner against my bank. Hmm? And the bank has to say in describing the same deposit that uh, they owe one million kroner to me. No, sorry, one trillion kroner to me. That's example. All right. So that's uh, the question that there is a, for every uh, every piece of money in existence uh, is both an asset and a liability. It's a form of credit. And in fact, we can understand uh, this money quite well. 90% of uh, what the processes that affect money can be understood very easily once we understand that money is just uh, credit and debt. Hmm? And they function exactly like credit and debt. In fact, they are simply a specific type of credit and debt that we give a special uh, name, money, because they absolve a special function. Uh, and the most special thing, of course, so that money does, uh, there is some disagreements here, but uh, they are theoretical disagreements. Uh, from a practical perspective, everyone agrees that the most important uh, um, function that allows us to differentiate between money and the other types of debts and credits is the fact that money is generally accepted within a certain monetary system to, for payment, for payment. Right? So we can go to the supermarket, we can go to Amazon, we can go to whatever is the local supermarket, and we can buy groceries with it. Hmm? So uh, that's a special thing. Uh, but that's just a special function that doesn't change the essence of money. Hmm? So I'm just, I'm going to try to use the whiteboard function here. Let's see if it works. Are you seeing the, yeah, hopefully you're seeing it. Okay, that's nice. Now, um, so I'm not very good at uh, drawing with a mouse, so it's going to be fun. So usually we use T accounts to express these things, the beautiful T accounts. And these T accounts uh, are simply easy ways to describe assets and liabilities. Now, on this side, we have a T account and we can uh, say that this is a T account of a private bank. And on this other side, we have the T account of a non-bank. Now, non-bank seems funny, but actually it is uh, how we describe certain kind of entities that are not bank, right? So it works quite well. Non-bank could be you, could be me, could be a firm. Hmm? Everyone who is not a bank, essentially, and a private bank, you should know. So it's a chartered uh, private entity who offer banking functions, right? So uh, what's our understanding here, just to essentially uh, put into these T accounts, uh, what we have said before. So if on the left, we put the assets and on the right, we put the liabilities, we should consider deposits as an asset for non-banks, right? If you have uh, a uh, checking account at your local banks, that's a plus for you, right? It's better to have one than not have, not have it. Okay, but for the bank, the same deposit is a liability, okay? It go, goes in the liability side of things, it goes in the liability columns. It's not that the bank had some money stored or stashed away somewhere, and then they gave you this money when the, you make a contra a loan with them. No, uh, they created a deposit for you. So suppose that this deposit actually came out of um, a mortgage agreement. So you ask for a loan. And as we said, the loan is a liability for you because of course, if you have a debt, that's not a positive thing for you, right? It's something that you have to repay. So it's not positive from an economic perspective. In itself, you can make money out of the money that you borrow, but uh, you have to repay the money, right? And the same loan, of course, is a credit for the bank. Now, when you go to the bank and you ask for a loan, and so you sign up this document, 
and the document is a plus for them and it's a minus for you. In exchange, you receive these deposits, right? You receive a deposit account with, uh, and they credit your deposit account of the amount of money that you asked in, uh, in, your, um, in your contract, but they create it out of scratch. Hmm? This is the point. They do not transfer money uh, from somewhere, the vault, to, or somewhere else to you. They create the deposit out of scratch. Notice that this, uh, essentially this transaction, if we say, okay, but uh, this, is, uh, this looks very weird because it seems like um, the non-bank is getting in depth with the private bank this is the easy part because yes, we ask we asking for a mortgage, so we are entering into debt. But at the same time, the private bank is entering into debt with the non-bank, and that's exactly what's happening, right? Not is that they got a plan, they uh, they have uh, more assets and more liabilities hmm, at the same time, both sides. So no one is getting richer, no one is getting wealthier. Money has been created, hmm, that's for sure, but no one is wealthier here. The bank is not wealthier hmm? because they gain a loan, but they also have a liability against you in the, in the form of the deposits. And you are certainly not wealthier. This is something that we obviously understand, right? When we ask for a mortgage, we have more liquidity at hand. We have more cash, not, not really cash. We have more deposits at hand. We can uh, uh, purchase the house, right? But we are not wealthier because we have to repay the mortgage, right? So. As you can see, this is the same for the bank, essentially. So money creation uh, can happen and does happen constantly, in fact, on an incredibly large scale, but it doesn't equate to wealth creation, okay? Creating money, although it might sound like creating money is the best way to get rich, right? And whoever creates money gets rich automatically, right? Because it creates money, no? Money creation happens exactly like any other form of credit creation. It's a social relationship. It requires two agents, okay? And uh, in this particular case, we can notice that in fact, it's a double form of credit creation, okay? Two forms of credits are created simultaneously. And as a result, the balance sheets get larger hmm, or longer because we, ent we have more and more entries in the balance sheets here. But, uh, the society is at, at, at large does not become wealthier because the additional money is balanced by additional debts. Okay, so this is a very important thing to 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 understand, and uh, uh, maybe most of you knew this already. Uh, if you didn't, this is the the big rock in the path to your basic knowledge of money uh, because it is uh, somewhat uh, different from what most people understand money as. So uh, once you understand that, you're quite good. Uh, so the main uh, process of money generation, money creation is, and for now we can go back here and then maybe we'll go back there. The main process of money creation, uh, as long as we understand correctly money as credit is quite simple. And that is, well, how is credit created by people borrowing, right? So if people borrow more, money is more money is created that's exactly what happens with money so by borrowing by borrowing and lending this is how most money is created right because money is a type of credit so for example if more mortgages are asked for and granted money is being created hmm? how is that money destroyed how is credit destroyed by repaying debts so when uh, mortgages are repaid money is destroyed that's quite simple. Uh, and as long as you understand money as credit, that's intuitive as well, right? Credits are uh, created when uh, uh, more people borrow and credits are destroyed when people repay the debts. Obviously, right? Credits are debts on the other side. Um, so that's one thing. That's one process. There's also another process, which is a bit different, uh, but it is equivalent in terms of um, let's say, uh, the basic understanding. Uh, now, let me go back to the, to the little thing here to the whiteboard. Let's see. Yes, um, another possibility here is that the private bank, the, uh, again, with the private bank and the non-bank, we're going to discuss the, uh, another possibility later on. Um, there is a possibility of uh, buying and selling assets 
between these two types of entities. And this possibility also generates money. Let's see how. Uh, well, a non-bank might have uh, an asset, let's say a financial asset, let's say that uh, they possess a bond and uh, uh, it could be a um, public bond, so public debt, right? A claim to public debt. Uh, and they possess that, that's fine. And uh, the, let's say that the private bank decides that they want to buy that bond or the non-bank wants to sell that bond to the private bank. So what happens is the following. First of all, let's make a line to, to understand that this is the initial situation. There's just a bond, there's nothing else. Well, then uh, what happens is the following. Well, the bond uh, moves, right? Because they sell the bond, so they lose the bond. And what they gain is a deposit because they get paid, right? They sell the bond to the bank. And on the other side, what happens here? Well, let's start here. First of all, they gain the bond, right? That's for sure because it moves, so the bond moves. And on the other side, interestingly, a deposit is created. Hey, would you look at that? So it's uh, slightly different than before because the action here, it's all on the asset side, but money has been created. That's for sure. So how can we destroy that money? Well, with the opposite process. With the opposite process that let's say that the people change their mind, right? And so the non-bank decided that they really liked that bond after all. So they want to buy it back. So they have to pay first. They use the deposit to pay. And as a result, they get the bond back. Quite simple. And here, what happens is, well, they lose the bond because they, uh, the bond is bought back by the non-bank. So. But they don't owe the deposit anymore. Ta-da. And so you go back to the situation that you had at the start. Money has been created in the second round. Money has been destroyed in the third round. We are back to the clean start. Okay. So as we can see, there are, some, uh, there are lots of interactions between private banks and non-banks that can uh, lead to the generation, the creation and destruction of money. And in fact, they do. And not, so a lot of people have been involved during their lives in the creation and destruction of money. And they didn't even know. Hmm? So maybe some of you already created some money participating in that. Maybe you even destroyed some money and you didn't even know. But uh, uh, the vast majority of money is created and destroyed the interaction between private people, between the private agents, hmm? uh, individuals, banks, firms, especially, and so on. Hmm? But of course, also the central bank. The central bank does that too. The central bank uh, uh, is not in interaction with non-banks, right? You cannot have an account at the central bank. These things, this thing might change soon, but uh, for now you cannot, right? Uh, try as you might. But private banks can and do have accounts at the central bank. And uh, it works exactly in the same way. Uh, the central bank can lend to private banks, creating money in the process. Uh, and the central banks can buy and sell assets to private banks, creating and destroying money in the process. And they do. This is the main channel through which uh, central banks actually create and destroy money. Uh, now, there are a number of issues here. I wanted to show you a different thing now. Uh, let's see if I can. Uh, just something that I use during uh, my lectures on this to visualize the issue. All right, so do you see the, the little triangle there? Now, uh, it's very important to understand that the money system is hierarchical, meaning that I have discussed uh, about the presence of central banks, private banks, and non-banks. And these three different types of agents are not all the same. From a monetary perspective, they, uh, they are organized into a hierarchy, which is very clear, with the central bank at, at the top, the private banks in the middle, and the non-banks at the bottom. Uh, it's useful to visualize it this way because you can easily say, see that the private banks can interact with the central bank and the non-banks, but the non-banks cannot interact with the central bank. That's quite important. Uh, also, we have said that uh, uh, when we do, were discussing credit, when we were discussing Bill Gates uh, and the homeless person, um, we were saying that the value of uh, credits and debts depended on the identity of the debtor, right? Uh, okay, 
uh, and we also said that bank notes are liability of the central bank and the deposits are liability of private banks. Mm. Uh, so by that logic, we would expect uh, bank notes to be more valuable than deposits. Is this your experience? No, it's not. Uh, rhetorical question. Uh, pe most people are, in fact, the vast majority of people are completely indifferent between paying with banknotes or paying with uh, their cards, right? It's just a matter of convenience. They And they don't consider the existence of an exchange rate between banknotes and deposits. They're one-to-one, -one, okay? I can exchange my deposits for cash. I can bring the cash to the bank and get in deposits one-to-one. -one. And that exchange rate is fixed, okay? It's at par. It's never going to change. It's never supposed to change. Hmm? This is, uh, however, uh, a conquest of an institutional conquest. Okay, uh, this is uh, this was not the case uh, for uh, the longest time. Uh, for a very long time, uh, uh, deposits, in fact, were less desirable than, uh, uh, let's say, central bank money or top of the pyramid money because that changed historically. Uh, and this uh, parity that exists now between private bank money and central bank money is uh, a creation of the, uh, the current institutional framework in which we live. So it is because there are very complex arrangements between central banks, private banks, and the state that allows uh, the deposits to be seen and perceived by non-banks as equivalent in quality and value as uh, uh, the money that is created by the central bank. And of course, this is a perception of the non-banks. For private banks, things are different. So private banks make a big distinction between central bank money and other private banks' money. They want central bank money. There is a difference and it's important for them. But for the pe people outside the banking system, this distinction does not exist and is not perceived. And therefore it's also not compensated. That's, uh, but here we're going to some more controversial thing. Now, all right. So money creation, money instruction, we have seen central banks, uh, we have seen private banks, okay. Um, we are also running out of time and we have to say something about the international elements, which are going to be important for Torvald, I guess, because MMT has a, uh, there's been a lot of criticism on MMT on, from the international perspective and they have answered those criticisms mostly, uh, but it is important to have a, a, a very a very simple idea of uh, how the international monetary framework works. We have said that the monetary framework is hierarchical, meaning that there are, yes, monetary theory, thank you, Bandy, that's, uh, I always take this for granted and I shouldn't. Anyway, um, uh, the international monetary framework is as hierarchical as the, the domestic monetary framework. So uh, exactly like we have a pyramid of sort, uh, uh, and at the top we have the central bank, at the middle we have the private banks, and at the bottom we have the non-banks. We also have a hierarchy of different, uh, um, let's say, different money, different national monies. So there are some currencies that are at the top of the pyramid, and there are some currencies, most currencies in fact, that are at the bottom. And uh, what does that mean? Well, I will explain you in a second, but first I wanted to show you the pyramid. Let me just, uh, the actual pyramid that we have in this uh, sort of thing, which is the following. Let me just share it with you. And there you go. So essentially the dollar is on top, as you can notice by the happy eagle with a lot of symbols. And uh, the other reserve currencies are in the middle, and I'm going to say something about those in a second, and everything else is at the bottom. Uh, which means, yes, the Norwegian kroner is at the bottom, sorry to say. Uh, but um, what are the reserve currencies? Uh, the reserve currencies are the currencies in which the central bank foreign exchange reserves are denominated. What does that mean? It's very simple. Uh, central banks have assets and liabilities as everyone else, as, as you do. And some of these assets, in fact, most of these assets are denominated in foreign currencies, right? So they have assets that are denominated in dollars, euros, pounds, and so on. And they make a choice. They could have these assets denominated in, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, currencies from, currency from Kazakhstan, but they don't. 
they don't. Uh, not because they're racist, but uh, they decide uh, uh, to do something else. And uh, we look at the decisions made by all the central banks in the world, uh, uh, the data that we have, uh, some of these data is secret, but the vast majority of these data is not secret. And we just look at uh, what kind of currencies appear to be valuable to central banks in the world. And then we put together all this data and we get, and we get this little pie that you see on the right side. And we see that most people go for dollars. Okay? And this is why we put the dollars at the, at the top. In fact, the dollars are quite significant, right? We can see that 66% circa of all foreign exchange reserves are in dollars. And these are free choices, by the way. Okay, So no one is forcing the central banks to keep their assets in dollars. So they are doing that out of their free will, mostly. Uh, then we have euros which uh, the euro is uh, uh, clearly the main uh, other reserve currency after the dollar, but as you can see, it's much less significant than the dollar, okay? So it's a, it's a big step between the first and the second. Hmm? Uh, and then what do we have? Well, we have the Japanese yen, which is quite important for a number of reasons. Uh, we have the pound, right, from the UK, which used to be uh, the top dog, right, used to be uh, the uh, the top international currency. Hmm? So it used to be where the dollar is today, but not anymore, as you can see. Then we have those currencies that once upon a time were part of the pound system. So we have the Canadian dollars, the Australian dollars, which is still part uh, of the pound system due to some particular arrangements that exist between uh, these entities. And then we have uh, a little bit for the Swiss. Uh, then we have all the other currencies put together. They usually as a result of local agreements and so on. And then the renminbi. The renminbi is very small. You can see it is uh, that uh, not particularly beautiful uh, sliver of orange that you can see between uh, the euro and the Japanese yen. Uh, and that's new. Okay, the renminbi used not to be there at all. It's only recently that it become part of the uh, of the foreign exchange reserves of at least some central banks. And what, why is important to to know this? Because there are a lot of people today that talk about the fact that um, oh the dollar uh, is its uh, uh, international role soon and so on. Um, well. This does not appear to be the case at all. So all the data that we have tell us that the dollar is dominant, is still dominant. Uh, and uh, a lot of people point to the Chinese currency as the new dollar of the near future. And if we look at the uh, reserve currencies, which is a very good indicator of these sort of things, you can see that the RMB has a lot of way to go, a long way to go before they can uh, actually take over the dollar. So uh, there are some people making the arguments, and most of the arguments are, uh, in this direction are not good. There are some good arguments in this direction, so don't don't discard these arguments. Uh, there, there are some that are good, but mm, it's uh, it doesn't appear like something that is going to happen soon. And the current crisis, in fact, has done nothing but uh, reinforcing the role of the dollar. So what we are seeing today is that everyone wants dollars. Okay, that's uh, that is not been. Uh, we can at all. And uh, uh, another thing that I want to say to you, and that's uh, the last thing, because, and then we open to questions if there are any, um, is uh, on the reason why the dollar on top, right? And uh, I try to be very, uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult question, as you can imagine. It's a very long, not difficult, but long question to answer. And uh, what I want to, to uh, say is just uh, to show you the main drivers. Uh, uh, there are four historical factors. These are the drivers of international value. So what determines the international value of a currency, what determines who is on top and who is not. Uh, four historical factors. Um, these are, I call it historical factors because this has been uh, uh, the drivers of uh, these sort of things for a very long time. Okay, So you can uh, analyze the dominance of uh, uh, the Athenian silver currency in the Mediterranean Sea in classic antiquity using this framework exactly as well as you can apply to today's issues uh, with some changes in the relative importance. So historically, commodity value, the material money was made of, was quite important. Uh, now it's not at all important because uh, uh, banknotes uh, are made of valueless material, mostly cloth, and it's useless materials uh, with no value whatsoever. And also banknotes are irrelevant because the vast majority of, uh, uh, of money today is just accounts. So there is no material. Uh, then the trade value, how valuable trade with issuing state is, right? 
so clearly what we what I can buy, what kind of commodities, goods, productive services I can buy with this uh, uh, money. And you may think, of course, uh, that uh, uh, you, the US offered a wide array of advanced uh, and sometimes unique commodities and productive services. But you should also think about the fact that the oil uh, trade is in dollars. So if you want oil, you want dollars and most likely you want oil. Uh, then investment value, the quantity and quality of investment opportunities in terms of financial investments. Uh, as, and uh, we know uh, which, uh, which is the main uh, investment hub of the world, it's Wall Street, right? Uh, there is only, Wall Street has only one rival, one real rival, uh, which is London. Uh, which used to be the uh, the key uh, financial center of the world. Some people argue that today still London is more important than Wall Street, and there are some reasons for saying that. Uh, but still, there are no other um, real competitors there. And power projection, uh, the ability to use force, coercion, beyond the national borders. Uh, this has been historically very important. It's still very important today. Uh, usually, to shock a little bit my students, I always say that uh, the US is the only country in the world that has the ability to kill you wherever you are. So, uh, and that's true. Uh, as uh, an the Iranian uh, uh, command learned quite recently, uh, and this is special to the U.S. The U.S. invests a lot of uh, a lot of money in developing this kind of uh, power projection capability uh, capabilities, and they are not uh, um, they are not money. Uh, it's not wasted money at all. Okay, so uh, if you if you think uh, they do this uh, for no reason, uh, well, think again. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, all uh, um, we have seen uh, changes and shifts in the hierarchy, the international hierarchy of money. Uh, so other, as, I, as I said before, the dollar was the pound, for example, before the pound there were other currencies. And uh, uh, every time the shifts have always been related to military shifts. Uh, and for example, the people arguing for the fact that China is going to become more and more important, uh, the Chinese currency is going to become more and more important, that they not only look at the financial development of China, they not only look at the economic development of China, but also they look at the, the development of the uh, Chinese fleet and the ability of China to project power uh, beyond the borders, which is quite important. So now we are run a little bit out of time, uh, 40 minutes, hmm? and I wanted to have some Q&A because I covered lots of things, uh, lots of difficult things perhaps, and uh, hopefully we, we have some questions. So I leave, the, uh, I leave, uh, leave it to you, Benedict. Okay, yeah, we've got a, a question here from um, Andrea, uh, who asks, uh, could you also explain how money creation by central banks work? Uh, so there's a QE in, in question mark behind that. Uh, then if the general public can't interact with the central bank, as you say, according to the money pyramid, question mark? So I guess that the first question is, uh, can you explain money creation by central banks, uh, what they do when they do say a thing like uh, quantitative easing? Sure, sure. Uh, yes. Um... The process works exactly the same as uh, uh, as I've shown for uh, the interaction between private banks and non-banks. It's just that you have to change the names. So uh, let's see. Maybe I can go back to the to the whiteboard and uh, just make this explicit, perhaps as best. Yes, beautiful, <clears throat> beautiful stuff. No, but uh, uh, let's uh, let's make it simple. And then here I can have the central bank. And here I can have the private bank, right? Because we have a oh, private, no. <laughs> private right bank. Private. Yeah, privy. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and well, uh, you kind of have it there, right? Um, so in this example, right, you have, uh, let's take it from the top, you have a, a let's say, a, a governmental bond uh, owned by a private bank. And then you have the central bank uh, buying the bond. So the bond moves. It's uh, not anymore an asset of the private bank, it's an asset of the central bank. A deposit uh, is created, right, for the private bank. And there you go, money is created. That's the magic of QE. Yes, it's a bit disappointing, uh, but that's all there is to it. And of course, you can also use the uh, reverse magic to destroy the money. Uh, now, why would you do, ever do that? Uh, you would do that uh, because, uh, well, for a number of reasons, uh, uh, but the, uh, the most important reasons uh, that uh, historically has been used is that uh, uh, you want money to, have, uh, you want the banks to have lots of reserves, right? And these deposits at the central banks are usually called reserves, 
right? Because uh, uh, if they have lots of reserves, reserves do not make money for banks. Banks are for profit. Banks look for profitability. If they have a lot of reserves, they need to have even more loans, even more profitable loans. Otherwise, they're not going to be making money. Otherwise, they're going to be bankrupt. So if you force, if you give them a lot of reserves, the assumption is the banks are going to go out of the way to lend to the productive economy, right? Which could be to consumers or hopefully to producers, right? To firms and so on. So you want to load them up on reserves in order to, um, in order to have them do that. But for a very long time, it has been known, as Cain said, that this is pushing on a string. Uh, you can pull on a string, right? If you think about it, you can pull something on a string. That's easy. You, that works. But you cannot push anything on a string. It, uh, it doesn't work, okay? So we can push reserves on banks. But uh, if there are no good debtors around, if there are no people, uh, if the good debtors have the money already and they don't need more money, and if the people who are willing to borrow are not good prospects, they are not good investments around, no matter how, many, how much money we put in the banks, uh, is going to be significant and the banks are not going to lend because yes, they might not make any money with the reserves, but at least they are not losing money with them. And in fact, nowadays the QE is, has been repurposed, especially in Europe, if you look at the very recent policies that have taken place for Corona, uh, it's essentially a subsidy. Because uh, um, right now, what, the, what most uh, uh, European private banks can do is the following trick, which is quite easy. Uh, they can go borrow money at the central bank and they pay essentially no interest on that. And they can just uh, keep this money as deposits at the central bank and they receive interest on that. So it's the easiest trade in the world. Yes, yes, Benedict, you, your face is the face of understanding. So it's, it's exactly as if you could go to your bank and borrow and then just keep it in the deposit. And then every, every month you receive a, a little bit of cash, uh, because a little bit of interest because of that. So yeah, it's a carry trade done, provided explicitly by the central bank. And the reason is uh, that uh, they don't want the private banking system of Europe to die because uh, it is currently unprofitable and there are a number of large systemic banks that are on the brink. You might know the names of some of them. And uh, therefore, this is a sort of subsidy policy. It is limited. They cannot borrow a huge amount of uh, money they get it because otherwise you borrow infinite amount of money, right? And then, and then you're set. No, uh, there are limits. Uh, and uh, so it's a subsidy, right? Uh, it is a form, you could call it a form of helicopter money, although that's not really the case. Um, then, okay, then we have a, a question yeah, from Andre. Yeah. Andre, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think the central banks should be part of the state apparatus as opposed to today in most countries? Uh, so, for example, the Fed is, is, is privately owned. Mm. Um, also, is the inflationary focus winning over the other issue? Would you, would you yeah. like to uh, specify what that other issue is, Andre? Yeah, I, I can start with the first question. And in the meantime, we give uh, some time to Andre to... To, to perhaps add to, to the question, so then I can answer the second question. Over issues in general. <laughs> all right, so uh, do you think the central bank should be part? Um, all right, so historically, um, the development of central banks are, are different depending on, on the, uh, the country that you look at. Um, in some countries, it was essentially a private bank at the start. It was a private bank that uh, gained a dominant position. Uh, and then this dominant position led this, uh, this private bank to start doing some functions that today we associate with central banks. And then eventually the, uh, the state uh, entered into a series of agreements with this that became more and more formal uh, and uh, then created the, the central banks that we have today. In some other countries, the central bank was a, created, a creature of the state, right, right from the start. But interestingly, uh, in both cases, uh, uh, if they start with private or they start with the public, uh, there is a tendency on both sides to uh, reach the central bank status. And the central bank current status is a bit of a hybrid creature. It is described as, uh, as being at the same time the bank of the state and the bank of the bankers, right? So and being, having this mixed hybrid private public uh, entity. And there is a lot of reasons and depends who you ask. So there are sociological explanations, of course, uh, run in terms of class. Uh, there are uh, economic explanations that run in terms of what they're supposed to do and uh, the fact that uh, if central banks do not have access uh, 
to very critical uh, information, inside information regarding banks, they cannot do that job. And so they need to be very friendly with private banks, no matter how public they are, uh, because otherwise they would not get the information required to uh, do the job. Uh, so it's, um, and there are of course other explanations. Uh, and the problem is, can you, can they be made public? Sure, they can be made public. Uh, can uh, some of them are very influenced by by public actors, by the way. So the Federal Reserve is independent, uh, but up to a point. Uh, the European Central Bank is more independent, but simply because there is no corresponding public actor. There is a variety of public actors, right? So um, already the central banks uh, uh, sometimes are influenced heavily by the state, uh, and they can be made public. Uh, that's uh, not. Uh, that would not be the end of the world because uh, anyway they would not really act as a completely public entity if they would uh, they would function not particularly well in the current context so um, I, I would say that that reform to be to be really uh, relevant in terms of consequences would have to entail a more broad scale reform of the entire financial system which is of course quite difficult to, to achieve. Um, yes, uh, the inflationary focus, uh, other issues such as creating money to buy back public land, investing in, yeah. All right, the inflationary focus is winning over other issues. Well, that's the thing, um, the inflationary focus. Uh, banks have, historically central banks have two, um, had two tasks, two missions. Uh, one which was to ensuring uh, uh, low to no unemployment, let's say low stable unemployment, and the other one which was a uh, low stable inflation. Okay, uh, then the unemployment thing kind of became auxiliary because uh, uh, it became institutionalized that there is a trade-off between inflation and unemployment and uh, between uh, the two regimes of low unemployment, high inflation or high unemployment, low inflation, the second one was considered preferable by the people who made this kind of choices. Um, so uh, it is true that inflation's, uh, inflation is a concern for central banks, but let's look at what happened since the crisis. What happened since the crisis is that most uh, central, a lot of central banks have failed to hit the inflation rate in the sense that inflation was lower than it was supposed to, do, to be. So the European Central Bank has failed to reach the inflation rate because inflation was too low okay, uh, for uh, more, more than a decade. Uh, and uh, so the inflationary concerns are, um, usually they don't come from central bankers these days because they know, because they, they in fact, uh, the they concern about inflation is that inflation is too low, perhaps. So uh, these concerns are usually deployed by other entities. Uh, they are deployed in public discourse, of course, and uh, uh, they, they might be significant. Uh, right now, most people in the monetary discourses and so on, uh, they tend to, uh, not give too much focus on those things. Uh, investing in infrastructure, rewilding the econo ecology, buyback public land. Uh, the usual answer from central banks is, uh, oh, this is great. Uh, this is not a job. Uh, so it's, uh, it's been quite consistent, right? In the sense that uh, the idea from the central bank has said, well, if the fiscal uh, authority so is if the state let's let's be clear wants to do any of that we are very happy we like green stuff uh, and we are even willing to discuss the possibility of funding these sort of uh, facilities created by the state somehow some way uh, but we are not going to do this on our own because that's not part of our mandate and uh, uh, so good luck with that um, there's been lots of uh, proposals uh, some interesting some less some very interesting uh, but this proposal may have uh, consistently hit the wall. So it will not happen uh, uh, involving just the central banks. Mm. Uh, yes, uh, Livana, uh, bringing it a bit on the controversials, what are the most current discussions points between heterodox and orthodox monetary theory? When should we pay extra attention in conventional economics lecture or monetary theory? Always, always, of course, pay attention in class. No, I'm kidding. Um, so <laughs> lots of uh, controversies. Um, Right now, there is more consensus because the crisis have really forced um, a more, um, let's say, realistic view of on money and banking on uh, on the neoclassical side. Uh, but you have to understand that uh, here there is a question of theory. Now we enter the uh, the, the domain of theory. Um, so the current neoclassical perspective is the following. Uh, yes, uh, the description of the reality provided by the uh, heterodox community, uh, yes, it was more realistic. It was closer to, to reality, but 
our description of the process in theoretical terms is still more useful to understand certain processes. So uh, there is still that, um, in the sense that uh, the uh, big debate, uh, big divide here uh, seems to be mostly that uh, uh, on how we interpret what is going on and what is really important. Uh, and is it really important to focus so much on the uh, hydraulics uh, and the, the actual uh, processes that take place in banking and money to creation, or is it irrelevant and we should look at other uh, elements instead? So there is a lot of debates. And plus, of course, there is uh, the heterodox has essentially uh, claimed victory on this debate, saying, well, you started by saying that these things were not true, and now you agree that these things are true. So we won. And in that sense, they won. The other side is saying, uh, no, so uh, we started by, by saying that these things were irrelevant and we still say that, so uh, we won. Uh, so take it for what it is, okay? Um, then, uh, so the US can safely print more money to fund themselves a government unit than any other government. Yes, bro, uh, that is exceptionally correct. In fact, the French have coined uh, a fantastic uh, term for this, hmm? which is an exorbitant privilege. They call this situation an exorbitant privilege because what they notice, and this they did in the context of the Vietnam War, right? They noticed the following, that the United States could have a very generous welfare system because once upon a time, the United States had a very generous welfare system. I know, shocking. And, uh, and they could also have the biggest military in the world. And they could also uh, pump an immense amount of money into expanding that military for questionable purposes, such as the Vietnam War. Uh, and uh, there was no limit to that. There was nothing that the other countries could do uh, to limit that. And essentially what happened was that uh, uh, the United States were forcing inflation uh, on a global scale, uh, but there were no, there were no limits uh, to that process. And this uh, uh, led to a number of problems and eventually that led to the Nixon shock. So to the end of the Bretton Woods Agreement and the end of the international order that supported the, uh, the world uh, after the Second World War. Uh, and also essentially this led to the collapse of the state-based financial order that we had after the Second World War and the rise of the private uh, finance-based order that we now have today. Uh, this is important. Uh, it's a long story and I didn't cover that doll, so I know that might seem a bit strange, but what you have to understand is that uh, today private entities and financial entities are, uh, are so powerful and important because public entities failed to agree on how to work it out between themselves. And so it was, uh, it, this created a big, big uh, scope. Uh, a big role to be played by private actors and they do that. So um, a lot of the discussion on we should, uh, you know, cut down on these private entities, we should cut down finances too strong, we should have more uh, public involvement and state involvement and so on. Yes, all good. Uh, but uh, the problem is that uh, uh, in the past this solution was there and the solution failed uh, uh, due to a number of international problems. Um, and these international problems might still be there. I don't know if you think that today the world is uh, internationally more cohesive. Um, it might be argued that it is not. And so that makes every public-based solution very difficult. But this is, uh, as you can see, it's going quite away from the basics of the money. Um, curious to know the intellectual reasoning, economic rational that prevents individuals from being able to access central bank funds without the private bank acting as intermediary. Very good question. Um, okay, so first of all, they have a very small recourse to a central bank, which are the banknotes, right? Because you can have banknotes and banknotes are ultimately liabilities of the central bank. But as we said, they are mostly irrelevant. Why not access in the central bank? For a very simple reason, because then private banks are mostly useless. So think about it. Um, why would you bank uh, at the private bank if you could bank at the central bank? So why not having a deposit at the central bank? Mm, there are no very good reasons for that. So um, essentially, uh, this would uh, make uh, a lot of business moving to the central bank, especially the best business, by the way, and leaving the most risky business to the private banks. And as a result, uh, private banking will become even more unprofitable. And central banks are not for profit. So this would not give anything useful to the central banks and it would create problems for, for the stability of the private banks and would create, it would lead to a less stable situation. Essentially, if you were to uh, open the floodgates and uh, having the central banks be more active directly with the non-banks, uh, then it's, uh, it's better to go all the way. So it's better to go to a public uh, financial system 
uh, entirely because you could do that. Uh, instead, because the mixed, the hybrid version would work uh, even worse than what we have today. So this is why a lot of people are very scared and concerned about uh, about helicopter money and other policies that might lead to uh, stronger interaction, integration between non-banks and central banks. Not because inflation, inflation is convenient for because it's easy to, to tell people, but uh, uh, it is because it would create huge problems for private banks. Um, yes, do private banks need central bank money to create money? I mean, it's not like they lend out the reserves. No, they don't lend out the reserves. Uh, they don't need central bank money. They need central bank access. They need to have uh, the possibility to borrow and lend under certain clear given uh, conditions to the central bank. And they need that because they need to interact constructively with other private banks. Uh, there are a number of reasons there. Uh, if you think about it, uh, imagine what happens when uh, uh, between banks every day, right? Because when you pay something, what happens is that money moves between banks, right? And uh, the problem is that the other banks might be fine with you, uh, Bank A, uh, running a deficit against Bank B, but then Bank B might ask you for reserve money, might ask you for central bank money, and then you need to be able to access that. So uh, it's uh, uh, the, the easy model uh, that you study where you know you have a certain amount of reserve money and then you multiply that amount and this is the amount that you can lend. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, it's also mostly useless. Also, uh, it depends uh, uh, so much on the institutional uh, framework uh, in which the bank is operating. And right now, there are so many reserves in the system that the reserves, the amount of reserves is really not a constraint for anyone really. So that's, uh, that's not that important. Uh, the access is very important. No. Benedict, uh, uh, we're running out of time, I know, but uh, you have a question here. What merit is there in treating money as a commodity models? Uh, it is mainstream in education, so clearly there must be some sort of merit in it. Uh, yeah, well, there might be some merit. Um, let's see what the merit might be. Um, first of all, uh, there is a very important merit, uh, which is the fact that uh, uh, most uh, um, general equilibrium models uh, do not have money. Uh, they do not have credit and debt, and uh, they do not have money. They only have commodities, um, and they don't need money. Money plays no role there. So people have a number of things uh, and preferences, and they find a way to exchange these things until they have the perfect uh, uh, mix of things for the present and the uh, infinite future. So why do you need money for that? You don't need money for that. Uh, so if you want to put money inside this model, well, the easiest thing, the easiest way is to uh, model this money as uh, another commodity. And perhaps, and then, however, you have to introduce uh, some particular reason why people want that. And uh, for example, uh, historically, intergenerational models were quite popular, which means that, okay, let's assume that there are such things as generations, because uh, the economic agents, as you know, they are, are immortal, right? So there, there is no need for generations. Uh, but let's assume that actually they're not. Let's assume that there are generations. And let's assume that you can uh, uh, you cannot uh, uh, leave uh, to the next generation anything commodity-based. So you cannot leave your stuff. You can only leave money. And so people want money because they want to leave the money to the next generation. And then we can uh, uh, model money. But we don't need to model it as anything else as a commodity. So we can use the very complex apparatus of thought and math that we developed for this uh, to model money, right? So as you can notice, but this is uh, because the, the idea here is not so much to have a, a realistic uh, um, theorization of money. Uh, it is mostly to uh, to be able to say, no, no, our models are monetary models. We integrate money in our models. It's not that there is no money in the models. So it was mostly to extend and defend the models uh, the, themselves rather than understanding money. Um, within monetary uh, theory itself uh, um, and within, of course, finance, uh, these things usually don't happen. So money is not... Uh, it's not described as commodities. Second reason, uh, outside from history of uh, economic theory in uh, uh, history of economics in general, um, there was such a thing as gold uh, once upon a time. And uh, uh, we had a period of time in which uh, the monetary system uh, was based on 
gold. Uh, and gold is very much a thing and not a credit. Uh, gold that still exists today it is mostly irrelevant, but uh, it still exists. Uh, some people argue for its ultimate relevance. Uh, some people also from some people, some neoclassical, some Marxist even, uh, there are some arguments. Uh, from practical perspective, it is irrelevant. From a theoretical perspective, it might not, but I, I think you're well, okay, it's it's a long discussion. Um, the point is, uh, a lot of uh, what the basics of uh, monetary theory was uh, developed during that time, during the time when gold was there and gold played a role. Even if now we're looking back, we're looking at it and we say, well, actually the, the role of gold was really, really small at that time. But at the time, this was not how it was perceived. So a lot of the basics of the discussion was cre were created the way even inside monetary theory. So there are some merits, the historical merits. Uh, are they useful to understand money today? Not at all. Uh, if you have a practical perspective, not at all. If you have a, a theoretical perspective, eh, if you have a very advanced theoretical perspective, yes, students usually tend not to have that because you have to start from the basics, you cannot start from the advanced, so it's mostly confusing. Um, of course, you can find different opinions there. Da, da, da. What is your opinion on the veil of money we're taught when you go through monetary theory? Yeah, again, um, Again, if you are if your interest in is understanding money, of course, an assumption that money is useless, it's not going to get you that far. If your objective is understanding uh, long-term uh, neoclassical macro models, uh, the assumption is necessary. So, uh, and I think it is important to understand that one, what neoclassical macro models uh, of growth, especially long-term growth, are telling you. Uh, it is. I think. Uh, I think it is. Uh, it is valuable in that particular context. So, when, whenever you want to learn uh, neoclassical macro, that assumption remains quite quite necessary. Advanced macro, you can drop that assumption. Now there are advanced neoclassical macro models with banks and uh, and money. Although initially they still model money as if it was concrete, as if it was something that you store somewhere. So the banks were storing money and then give it to people. So. Uh, but now it seems that they're finally, finally, finally creating models in which there is a money as credit, as it actually is. So, uh, is it, uh, and the veil of money thing is, again, it's a very long story. And uh, historically, there are reasons. Uh, one of the important things was that it was a matter of prestige. Uh, I know it sounds silly, but uh, uh, it was important for economists. So essentially, uh, all uh, the people that were not economists, uh, but they were traders, uh, uh, bankers, uh, and also normal people, thought that the economy was all about money. Uh, uh, okay, and the economists instead, uh, they realized that uh, the growth of the economy and the prospects of a uh, long-term prospects of the economy uh, were about production. Uh, it was about the capabilities uh, of, uh, of a country to produce, uh, to organize, uh, um, to work together, right? Uh, and they were right. Hmm? Uh, they were essentially right. It, it, these things are very important. Uh, and uh, you might say they're even more important than money. That, that is difficult to disagree with. And so uh, one of the things that you had to agree with in order to be, to be an economist and be recognized as such was to recognize money as essentially a veil, okay? And that's uh, something that was for, you know, uh, people that were not smart enough to realize that what really mattered was beyond the veil. So this is how it started. Then, of course, it became theorized and became a different thing. But sociologically speaking, this is quite important to keep in mind. Uh, it is still a, matter, a bit of a matter of prestige. So people that argue for the relevance of money uh, have for many, for many, many years been considered, uh, well, there was a category in, in economics which were the monetary cranks. So the people that were too stupid to realize the money is not so important and they were insisting on the relevance of money. Now uh, this is mostly done with. Um, yeah, so uh, should I take the last question, Benedict? What do you say? Or we can wrap up as you wish. Uh, I, I think we can, uh, I think we can do one more question. I don't see the harm in that. All right. So why are politicians and central governments uh, still stuck in we don't have enough money trapped? Do you think public discourse around money monetary theory will be more informed after this crisis? Um, well, why are politicians and central government? Uh, all right. So we don't have enough money. We don't have enough money um, is not necessarily a trap uh, for, uh, it might be somehow true for certain, in certain contexts. Um, I'm Italian. And uh, uh, Italy is uh, is not having a great time now. 
Uh, and uh, Italy is also the government that uh, uh, pushed the smallest uh, uh, fiscal stimulus and relief package so far, by far. And the reason is that uh, um, we don't have money. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, of course, we do have money. Of course, we can uh, uh, we can borrow more money, and we never had such good uh, such low interest rates for our public debt as we have today. So we could create more public debt right now, and therefore we can create more. Um, the, the state can uh, enter deficit and can spend more and more, and that's not a problem. Uh, what is said by saying that is that. Well, but if we do that, then uh, when the crisis is over, our uh, debt to GDP ratio will be more than 150%, perhaps, and uh, that will be entirely inconsistent with the uh, uh, European Union rules, and that is going to generate a number of problems because we are essentially going to have a conditionality and we don't want that, and so on and so forth. So, um, this is just the Italian, Italian example, right? Uh, there are others uh, that, are, that depend on the context. So sometimes uh, there are some complex matters that are uh, expressed simply in this way, right? So sometimes it's not entirely insignificant. Sometimes there is some significant stuff behind it. Some of the time is, uh, is, um, uh, is ideological discourse. So it is an important, it is part of the, uh, of the ideological position of certain parties regarding what the economy is, uh, how the economy, what, is, what should be the relationship between private and public. And it is, of course, a very useful weapon to constrain the, public, the reach of the public sector. So if uh, I have the legitimate belief that uh, uh, most of the economy should be in private hands, uh, what I want is something that allows me to say no to the expansion of uh, public, uh, uh, public actions, public activities. And this allows me to, to say no. There is no money for that. There is no money for that, so we can do that. Um, is it dishonest? Well, mm, not entirely. It, it, is, uh, uh, it is pushing for uh, your own ideological position, which is legitimate in a democracy so uh, that's fine so there are some some people that do that because they know exactly what they're doing and uh, and it works for them do you think public discourse uh, will be more informed after this crisis well um, I think it will be differently informed in the sense that uh, uh, public discourse evolves uh, very quickly it is not true that people don't learn it is not true that uh, uh, oh this, these things are too complex no then, then that's I think that's false uh, people do learn uh, and public discourse always uh, advances but uh, um, it is uh, uh, it is not only a matter of reason it is not only a matter of knowledge uh, irrational elements are present on both sides and they are going to be uh, to be driving the discourse so the discourse uh, will uh, evolve but it will not it will never be solved based on the fact that someone will come and tell people very calmly no people look this is how it works uh, money is credit and so on this is not how political discourse is mostly uh, resolved and even if uh, we were to agree entirely on all these things that we discussed today you know, money is credit uh, so the, uh, it is created and destroyed constantly over time it is not controlled by the state blah, 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 blah. Uh, we could still find significant uh, uh, disagreement points so you could have uh, a person in the room that agrees entirely with everything i said and that person might have a completely different policy stance than my own and it could be a completely reasonable one. So uh, there would still be a disagreement there on what the state can, could, and should do. Yeah. So that's what I would say.